It's been a long day. I hope everyone's still kind of awake and we have some coffee or wine. Wine's better than coffee um, at this time. But uh, thanks again for, for hosting us. Millennium Alliance has been great. Dinner was wonderful. I have, it's my privilege to sit here with Dr. Agarwal. I refer to him as Shantanu. He's a, a dear friend and it's the first time we're, we're doing this. But uh, really uh, working closely with him through AHIP, through our efforts to reduce fraud, waste, and abuse at his role at as the deputy administrator at CMS, um, it's going to be very difficult to find a more thoughtful person, insightful person in healthcare. He's been a, a role model, mentor, and um, a public servant, and we're really grateful for that. So um, I, I think it's really important in his new role as the CEO of, of National Quality Forum to talk a little bit about the, the evolution of that organization and the impact it's going to have on care, both on, on the patients and, and plan members that we have the, the privilege to serve but also what we're going to do to transform um, to a value-based care model and, and increase the value that we're, we're delivering to the communities and to the families, the employers, and organizations. And so I think a, a few minutes early on, Sean knew it would be great to talk about uh, NQF, your role there, um, in kind of the future as we're moving forward. And then we'll open it up to some uh, lively discussions and Q&A and go from there. Okay, well, thank you. Um, uh, let me just start by thanking the Millennium Alliance for the opportunity. Thank you to Rahul. Uh, I have uh, basically accepted any invitation that Rahul has offered me. That has led me into trouble on more than one occasion, but uh, it's, it's always fantastic. Uh, and, and, you know, what a great conference. I mean, to have this level of intimacy to be able to uh, talk with you all, uh, I think, is really fabulous. Uh, so thank you for that. So the National Quality Forum, um, I, you know, I, I like to start my talks with a little bit of an act of bravery, but it's always on the audience's part and not mine. Um, who here does not know what the NQF is or what we do, the National Quality Forum? It's okay to be brave. It's all right. I don't mind. Yes. All right. The, the honest souls in the room. So the, uh, the NQF is a private nonprofit. We're based in D.C. Uh, we were founded in 1999 uh, following a President's Commission report from the Clinton administration um, well, with the goal of bringing more uh, standardization and sort of scientific methodology to quality measurement and improvement. So at the time, in, in the 90s, there, there was obviously this huge burgeoning interest in quality to air as human had just come out. Um, lots of work being done, but there wasn't a lot of standardization and consistency. Certainly nothing that moved across the entire kind of healthcare system. Uh, and so the notion was to create a, specifically a private entity that would help to do this for uh, the industry and would specifically stand outside of the government uh, so that it could give recommendations to the government, not really be part of it. So NQF has existed since 1999. Uh, one of our first and core programs is measure endorsement. So what we do is we review measures. Uh, they, they, you know, literally started this process in 2000, and, and it's been iterated on a number of times since then. Uh, anybody in healthcare is welcome to bring a measure to NQF, uh, and we impanel lots of different clinical committees that then look at that measure, uh, compare it against scientific standards that NQF creates, and then they make a recommendation about whether to quote unquote endorse that measure or not, which essentially certifies it. And an endorsed measure can be picked up by a variety of sources. CMS heavily relies on endorsed measures. Other health plans, as you know, um, uh, rely on endorsed measures, provider organizations, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we have often thought of ourselves as being, you know, and, and we are truly multi-stakeholder. All of our committees are comprised of, so these committees that make endorsement decisions are comprised of clinicians and patients, health plans, technical experts, analysts. It's, it's really meant to be widely representative of healthcare. Um, so endorsement continues till today. Uh, we have about 630 endorsed measures, and we can talk a little bit, if there's interest around that, about what that looks like and how we maintain those measures. Um, five or six years ago, we started a new program of measure selection. So this was really, uh, whereas endorsement is available for anyone in healthcare, measure selection is really a program that we initiated for CMS. And so on an annual basis, uh, CMS submits measures to NQF for a public vetting. All of the measures that they want to use across Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, that includes value-based purchasing, alternative payment models, uh, pay for reporting programs. Those measures get put on a uh, list, a really unfortunately named list called the MUC list. Uh, we get that list at the end of the year. So, in fact, we got the MUC list this year just a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, and then we initiate a very multi-stakeholder process to try to make recommendations to CMS about those measures that should be included across Medicare and Medicaid. That has led to fundamental, I mean, you know, nothing's perfect. I wouldn't suggest that it was. But over the last five or six years of, of doing this work, we've led to a lot more alignment across uh, CMS programs than they had prior, right? So we've been able to look across, say, different Medicare programs and say, you should be using similar measures across those programs because you're interested in similar things. You should be able to um, align measures a lot more. Uh, you know, in Medicaid, we create a, created adult and child core measure sets, which are now uh, have been adopted by I think about 35 states, which has led to a, line, a lot more alignment in Medicaid than existed before. And then one of the innovations that we really tried in 2017, so the last go around at the at the beginning of this year, is we asked uh, CMS. You know, normally you've been giving us this list for ingressing new measures into your programs. Can we look at the programs in their entirety? Can we look at all the measures that are there to really, you know, help you decide if these measures are the right measures? And we actually created a process to recommend removal of measures. That was a huge thing for us. We, we feel strongly that, you know, there has to be sort of some control of measurement. It's got to point in the right direction. You know, if measures aren't doing their job, you've got to take them out of the program. So they agreed, uh, which we were, I think, a little bit happily surprised by. Um, so our committee's got a chance to look across the entire set of measures in use in Medicare and Medicaid, and we recommended a 20% reduction in measurement uh, for two main reasons, frankly. One was the, the measures had been topped out. There was no more possibility of quality improvement, and if there isn't, why go through the process of collecting and reporting? Uh, and the other one was the measure was no longer technically the best. We'd seen better on the endorsement side. So that was a real innovation for us. It was a real sort of step. It was a cultural change both at NQF and at CMS. Uh, and I think the, the report, the work was really well received. They've actually decided, uh, CMS has decided that they will continue that process going forward. We'll establish a real set of um, standards and reasons for why to remove measures. Now, you know, having worked at CMS for a number of years, uh, things are not instantaneous. Uh, they have to go through their own internal processes and rulemaking. So, you know, we expect them to do that. I'm not expecting them to remove 20% of their measures overnight. But I think the fact that we're having the conversation and the fact that we can engage a lot of external stakeholders in that conversation is really, really critical. The last thing I'll say is we have been rooted for uh, 18 years in quality measurement. Um, as, a, as an ER doc myself, uh, I came into NQF really asking how do we connect that measurement to the front line of care delivery. Uh, now this is not a new concept for NQF actually. I've, I've had uh, the great, um, I think one of the actually the fantastic aspects of my job is, has been able to talk to, we're, we're a membership organization, we have 430 members. Um, I've been able to talk to 170 of them in my first year. This is, I'm rounding out 11 months now. Um, uh, the members really have a very clear concept for where they think NQF ought to go, and, and their input has been really invaluable. In addition to that, I've talked to um, the sort of uh, the, the whole succession of NQF CEOs, and uh, in many respects, I find myself gravitating towards the first uh, CEO of NQF, uh, this guy named Ken Kaiser, who is absolutely amazing if you've ever had the chance to meet him. And he always had this notion that NQF would be a full service measurement and improvement shop. So as much as, you know, I think we all have this feeling that we should develop our own mission and ought to be really unique from all of uh, our, uh, all of our, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of the prior folks in the job, I find myself saying, I just want to get back to the roots of NQF. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, we can't measure things from afar and, and leave it at that. So um, we've been trying to do a lot this year in actually making strides in quality improvement connecting our work to actual improvements, creating tools and resources that providers can use at the bedside. And I think there's some good examples of that recently that have really worked. Uh, that's where I see a lot of potential for NQF to go in the near term, in addition to obviously, you know, more evolution on the measurement side. That's probably more than you needed to that first question, but. Yes, no, you know. I would love to talk more in terms of as, as it's, it's shaking out and the dust is settling a little bit more, <clears throat> we're figuring out, we have the measures down. That's great. It's a good list, right? How do we make that actionable? Like what's, the, the real question is really what's going on and why is it taking so long, yeah. I guess, is the best way. And it's because it is complex, but through a, an NQF perspective of what, are, what have we done really, really well at, ahead of schedule and where are some things that we really missed the mark, but through that failure, we've gotten closer. What yeah. are you saying in terms of... 
in terms of measurement? That's yeah, the... so yeah, great question. So I think there's a few things. Um, you know, I think we really started with this notion that we, uh, so, you know, to some degree have to let a thousand flowers bloom, right? Especially at a time when there wasn't a lot of science behind measurement. We uh, started this whole, our whole endeavor saying, you know, how do we encourage people to develop measures and then make sure that those measures are scientifically valid and rigorous. And so that's where kind of endorsement came in. Um, I think we are really at an inflection point now in measurement. So, you know, 630 endorsed measures, uh, one can really ask if that's the right number. Uh, you know, we are at this place right now in healthcare where, uh, on the one hand, we have a lot of measures. They are very technically complicated these days, really complex risk adjustment models, lots of evidence and science behind them. I think that speaks very highly of the whole endeavor, and that is not uh, really just an NQF comment. That is, you know, I think kudos to the entire ecosystem that has led to where we are today. But the reality is uh, we have uh, sort, of a mal uh, sort of a misalignment of measurement, right? So there are areas where there's very few to no measures that are really high quality. So take something like telehealth, vastly important to patients today, important to, uh, important to providers. You know, there are parts, rural parts of America that really rely on telehealth. That as a, an area of both spend and utilization is only going to increase. I, I think by the end of the year, you're going to see a significant telehealth bill come out of Congress for Medicare, uh, if not by the end of the year, you know, very soon after that. Uh, and it's, it, so that makes it problematic that we don't have a single endorsed measure in telehealth, right? I mean, where is the standardization? So um, there's clearly areas where there are important measure gaps, and then I think uh, you know, uh, other areas where there is measure duplication, um, you know, measures are sitting on top of each other that aren't actually aligned across the healthcare system. You know, I was talking to a colleague recently who did the, uh, you know, sort of measure collection across the payers that he deals with, and he found that there were 45 tobacco cessation measures, you know, just in his market. Yeah. So that's tremendous, right? I mean, thankfully not all of them are NQF endorsed. We didn't totally contribute that to that problem. But there, we do actually have a number of tobacco cessation measures in our portfolio. So, you know, that's an issue that we have to deal with fundamentally. So, you know, we are working this year on creating approaches to prioritizing measures, um, really thinking no more about just meet a scientific standard and you're in. We want best in class, right? So even if there's two measures that are in roughly the same space, uh, and both of them might meet scientific criteria, I think it's on us to say, well, how do we differentiate them? How do we pick best in class? That's not an answer that I can give you today, but we are definitely working on addressing it. Um, I think we have to do that. Um, I think the 630 number will change. We've got to fill gaps that are necessary. And fundamentally, I don't think we make enough progress if we don't ally, align the public and private sectors. And it's, it's uh, leading into the next one, but it's, how do you, it's very delicate because you don't want to remove and limit it to a standard because you do want personalization, right? Based on region, based on states, based on, on economic models that are out there, um, values of the decision makers and the policy makers might not like what you're saying, um, so they might not actually bless it, right? So it, you need to have that diversity in terms of program structure, but you don't need 45. It's, it's, similar to what you're saying, right? Yep. One of the things on the private and public sector aspect of it is, you know, there's, there's, there's the standard and the entity of coming down with these, these measures, but then what's going on in my own backyard and your own backyards is, is so much more transparency than what some entity can have there too. So the room for collaborating on the private side and lessons learned and, and data-driven kind of policy making and measure creation um, is there a mechanism for that, and, and is that along the lines of anyone can bring a measure to NQF, and is, is that the private and public collaboration that we're looking at? Yeah, I think there's a few facets to it. So, uh, you know, AHIP is a good example, right? So there's the AHIP CMS Core Measure Collaborative, which I think has really sought to align, sort of, you know, particularly I think Medicare with the private sector. Um, I think that's an important collaborative, and we've been involved in it, but I think there are ways of jump-starting it that, you know, um, you know, we've certainly been talking about with AHIP to, to see if there's interest in kind of the next evolution of this. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think if we are really, there's a lot of good reason to achieve measure alignment. If you are a physician, clinician, hospital, on the receiving end of measurement, there's a lot of discordance in any given market. And that discordance in and of itself is distracting, right? So you don't know what to really focus on, what the greatest priorities are. And then there's enough variability in measurement, even if the priorities were roughly similar, there's enough variability in measurement where dealing with that variability actually becomes a distracting uh, phenomenon, right? It actually takes your eye off the ball of improving the quality of care. 
So I, I think there has to be a much greater amount of public and private alignment. And this is frankly, you know, when I think about our mission, uh, we have, uh, we started with this mission of really being at the center of healthcare. And I think a lot of our work for good or bad, various forces has gravitated towards the public sector. I think we have to bring that back to the middle again, um, do a lot more work with the privates. So, you know, whether it's the core measure collaborative or other approaches, I think really thinking about creating measure sets, um, you know, offering benchmarking, uh, you, know, you know, creating sort of uh, working on a set of priorities that we can all agree with is really critical. We've got to cut down the number of different, uh, essentially different measures that are looking at the same thing, uh, because I think it creates too much confusion in the industry. Yeah, and, and the variation, and the, there's a lot of different ways that we can go about getting to that desired health outcome, and there's a lot of opinions around that as well, too. Um, you know, with, with analytics and informatics, with uh, technology and processing speeds and, and tech being cheaper that's out there, um, tools available for adherence, um, you know, data sharing, all of those things that are out there, there's, there's mechanisms and there's a lot of noise, right? And so how do we cut through that um, in, in terms of kind of your opinion on an NQF and leading the way and collaborating with other multi-stakeholders to be able to kind of cut through that noise to get to the most viable, most effective framework around a specific condition? Um, is that just through the, the just putting it out there and measuring it and tweaking it as fast as we can kind of like, uh, lean methodology, or is it more the cerebral academic yeah. type of approach that I like to refer to as design by committee, but in all due respect. We have a lot of committees, you know. <laughs> sure. uh, so I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, so one of the things that I encountered coming into the job was, uh, you know, like I said, we I talked to a lot of members, a lot of stakeholders that I think do care deeply about NQF and, and were sort of giving me the the real truth of what it meant to work with NQF. And the reality is, you know, we do value, of course, a really multi-stakeholder approach. Um, those kinds of processes take time. Um, but I think we were taking too long. So um, what I, what, when we did some data analysis, we found out that it took an average of 20 months for a measure to go uh, through the endorsement process. Right, so that's, much too long, right? That doesn't, uh, that does not encourage the kind of change in healthcare that we need to see. That doesn't, in, that doesn't really catalyze the transition to value that we all want. So we, you know, just on basic redesign of our processes, we did take a lean uh, uh, approach to our endorsement process this year, did a lot of work. I mean, it's been all year long and I think we're gonna spend much of 2018 implementing new changes around it. Um, but the goal has been to significantly reduce that 20 month time. And so we now have gone to a place conceptually where we can reduce that 20 months to seven months. Now, seven months might be something we still need to make progress on, but that's significant, right? That's a significant reduction. One of the biggest drivers of that 20 months was that um, while we have a lot of clinical committees, not every single one was available all the time. There was a lot of variability. Um, so, you know, we have clinical committees, say cardiovascular, infectious disease, pediatrics, et cetera. Um, not every committee was able to meet every year uh, out of resources and sort of internal issues, uh, other issues. Um, and you know, I, I was surprised. You know, I started attending every single committee meeting when I, when I uh, uh, joined the organization. And when I went to the infectious disease committee, they said they were meeting for the first time in four years. And it shocked me. It shocked me. So if you were out there in the community and you had a great HIV measure, and there were great HIV measures, you waited four years or up to four years to even have that measure be considered and then wait a few more months to have that measure be endorsed or not endorsed. That is not tenable for healthcare, right? That is not us playing our role. So we really uh, decided that we had to do a redesign. We have now gotten to a place where not only is every committee available every year, we will have two endorsement processes every single year. No process will last more than seven months. So this, we are hoping, will really jumpstart the consideration of all the right measures. We'll bring measures out of the woodwork that need to be out of the woodwork. Um, and then at the same time, you know, if we're meeting more often and doing more work, we can really focus our efforts on things like considering the whole 
portfolio of measures and asking, are these the right measures? So we've established a framework, uh, an approach for prioritizing measurement um, that uh, really seeks to you know, identify that best in class, identify where there are still gaps, and if there are duplication, really you know, uh, showing us where that duplication is so that we can address it from a policy standpoint. And, then, and this next one here is, is a matter of prioritization. There's no shortage in terms of what we can measure and, and the endorsements and, and, and challenges that we need to find solutions for. And the concept of, of industry versus market comes up to me too, where there's, there's an industry out there and people are, are creating buzz about their products and saying wearables is a good example of this and, and pushing it out there. And then there's a market where you know, someone's actually paying for it and they're tying it back in and integrating it in, into things that are there. That's happening a lot more. You see it with, yeah. with, with VCs and funding and, and shine, you know, shiny object syndrome that's, that's out there. We try to look at something and it, we're, we're problem stratification. Is this truly a problem for us? Is it inflective coming from the entity itself or is it reflexive where someone's telling me that, that this is what I need and I have this problem? How do you guys really kind of do the problem stratification or prioritize in terms of what you're going to be solving for, and then how can some of our, our AHIP members in here and, and the audience really kind of participate in terms of bringing that to the forefront and drawing that in for that kind of collaboration? Yeah. So, so we try to do a few things. So, um, you know, as I as I said, there are areas where there just isn't enough information right now, right? So we have been trying to take the lead uh, in, you know, if you take a topic like telehealth, and again, we started. 2017 saying, wait, why don't we have any measures there? So when that occurs, we, you know, one of the first things we try to do is we, we, um, we try to put out a strategic blueprint for what quality improvement really looks like in a particular space, right? So, you know, we uh, put together a strategy document essentially to say this is, if you were to look at telehealth, what would you want to measure from an outcome standpoint to show that telehealth is different from, say, the in-person clinical encounter? Um, so we literally did that this year. Um, we put out a report just a few months ago. And then what that usually then catalyzes is the creation of measurement around that framework. So, you know, we take a very consensus appro uh, approach for even the, st the strategic thinking. Um, then that leads to the measurement and then eventually those measures get adopted. So I think in, say, a couple of years time, we're going to see more of those measures come through our processes. So that's a way for us to influence thinking in the area, really be kind of a, hopefully on the cutting edge where enough, you know, work is not being done uh, and then just lead to the standardization over time. Another good example is care coordination. So, you know, we put out a care coordination report in 2015 because we were exactly in the same situation of not having enough measures that actually looked at care coordination as a topic and could identify good outcomes. Now, actually, that's an interesting area because care coordination is very hard to measure, uh, especially from an outcome standpoint. And we are, you know, we don't like process measures. Um, I think, you know, we've had a history of being steeped in process measures, but the industry is clearly ready to move on from there. Uh, it's very hard to create really good outcomes measures. Um, and in care coordination in particular, it was really challenging. So we have a care coordination committee that every year looks at these measures. We put out a major framework, a, strat a strategy document in, in 15. We get a number of measures, but they're not great outcomes. So I had the committee come up to me this year and ask, is it okay to not endorse really many of them? Uh, and I, I asked them, well, how many have you gotten? They said, we got more than 20, and we want to endorse one. Well, I said, well, tell me about the 19, because <laughs> this is going to be, you know, this is publicly challenging, right? Like to not endorse really very many of them. They said, many of them really are processes. They, you know, they're about a physician picking up the phone to indicate care coordination, or in some cases, literally, the measure has uh, faxing documents uh, built into the measure. You got to fax a document to meet the measure. And I said, well, I got no problem not endorsing the faxing measures. That's <laughs> problematic. Uh, we've got to move on from that technology. Um, but, you know, I, I think the committee was trying to be really conscientious and say, look, this has got to be about real outcomes. Uh, we don't want to just endorse something for the sake of having measures. Um, so there are clearly still really, really big challenges that we are trying to, you know, meet the mark on. One thing that we um, created because of issues like care coordination uh, and, you know, the other big area is patient reported outcome measurements. Everybody talks about in the qual community. Very important. I think it can lead to real alignment between patients and clinicians, but there aren't that many really good uh, 
patient-reported outcome measures out there. So we created this uh, new program just uh, you know, about 18 months ago called the Measure Incubator that seeks not only to identify, and we do a lot to try to identify measure gaps, but to actually bring the community in to fill those gaps in a very particular way. So we bring together funders and patients and others um, to actually, uh, you know, uh, kind of devise, conceptualize new measures beyond the strategic blueprint that we've been establishing. Uh, a lot of, 80% of the work that's done in the incubator is work on patient reported outcome measures. And we hope now 18 months into it, I think we're four, maybe five months away from producing a fully fleshed patient reported outcome measure for COPD that is outcomes based and, has, has, and otherwise I don't think would exist. So that's the kind of thing that I think we can facilitate really bringing the community along. Yeah, I know talking to my membership, the, the CEOs, chief medical officers, and really even down to kind of the, the field level is the, the compliance and regulation since the passage of the Affordable Care Act is just something that has just been, you know, I want to pull your hair out. Um, it's been very, very difficult, right? Uh, physicians. I was on the other, was on the other side of the ACA. Yeah, yeah, on that time. But um, just you know, 1,700 new measures for physicians, right, since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. That's, you know, for them to, to comply and do that is equivalent to about 15 and a half weeks more of work. We want them to see more patients. We want to increase access. You know, we're getting, how do we avoid getting in the business of, you know, we're straightforward is in the business of measurement or outcomes by any means necessary, but and throwing spending wisely and all of these other things and access out kind of out the window. How do we put some sort of um, more of an emphasis on the actionable? So you put the measure out there, but what is the, you talked about best in breed solution or measures, best in breed solution providers and things that, how do we do in best in breed actions to actually get there? Is there something that could be the evolution going forward? And I mean, that's a heavy lift, but we can put guide, guidelines out there um, and then just leave it to everyone else's own device on how they're going to get there. But that's something to do on our own without having that guidance. Is, it's almost like asking a patient to treat themselves. Yeah, no, it's, so it's a good question. So the ACA, you know, from an NQF standpoint, did a lot. I mean, the whole connection of measurement to payment, which, you know, obviously sort of preexisted the ACA, but was really ramped up in things like hospital VBP and other programs you know, was a major kind of increase in the um, focus on NQF. And we suddenly became, you know, I always like to say if you see a problem in healthcare and there's a storm swirling, NQF is going to be the boat in the center of it that's getting battered on all sides by different uh, groups. The ACA definitely did that. I think, you know, it clearly brought a lot of attention to connecting payment to value. And ultimately, obviously, that's very good for healthcare, but it was seismic in its, in its change. Um, I think where, you know, the system really still continues to need help, and I, I certainly think of this as an ER doc. You know, I used to be a consultant for uh, hospitals and health systems, and I still see the same issue, which is we are not a great, I, I don't think, kind of learning and innovation system as a whole. It is still quite challenging. If you think about being a 200-bed hospital in the middle of Pennsylvania and you're not called Geisinger, you're, you have a pretty hard time having the internal, <laughs> having the internal expertise, um, you know, standardizing the processes, even knowing what good looks like from a quality improvement standpoint. So you know, I think if there's been a shortcoming to the enterprise, it's been saying, here's the measures. We're going to grade you on this. We're going to alter your reimbursement. And to some degree, that alteration might be pretty significant for your bottom line. But we will not you know, give you any tools and resources to actually do better. We won't empower you in that sense to do better. I, I do think that that's a significant gap. It's something that we at NQF can play a role in. I mean, if you think about the core capabilities of bringing experts together, defining what best practice looks like, really looking at evidence, that is what we do day in and day out on measurement. I think we need to apply that to improvement. So when you think about you know, those individualized solutions, surfacing best practices, we can do a lot more of that. I'll just give you an example. So um, you, you know, we, in, in uh, late 16, we decided, uh, I, my, my predecessor, uh, to their great credit, decided that they were going to try to create a quality improvement tool. And our initial focus would be antibiotic stewardship critically important topic. The Joint Commission was rolling out new requirements in 2017, so we thought, uh, you know, we've got endorsed measures in this space. Why not put together a playbook 
for antibiotic stewardship for acute care hospitals. So uh, we did that, and our, the model that we utilize is very different from our measurement side. It's meant to not create new knowledge, it's meant to bring together the knowledge that already exists, bring together the experts, very focused effort, put it into a very tactical playbook, make it available to the public, iterate, iterate as necessary. So we put this playbook online in late 16, and it became the most downloaded resource off of the NQF website ever, That's great. ever. And uh, that was somewhat insulting because we'd been doing really good work uh, up until then. When's the next one coming out? Take the right. cue from that. Right? right. So no, but it clearly fit a need, right? There was a niche. Uh, it, you know, I think we hit a chord. And so this year we decided let's focus on opioid stewardship. We're doing stuff on uh, shared decision making, creating tools there. We're extending the opioid, uh, the uh, antibiotic work uh, beyond acute care settings to long-term care settings. These are things that we have to do. We're actually working, you know, we're going to uh, uh, working to launch a sepsis mortality uh, program because this year we, you know, I mean, these things dovetail together. We just uh, endorsed our first two sepsis mortality measures ever in 17. We know that they're going to be picked up by payers. There's lots of interest. That's a huge and leading driver now of mortality in the inpatient setting. We should focus on it. Um, so why not actually, if you're going to put out the measure and start grading hospitals accordingly, why not give them a couple of playbooks yeah. to do better by? Right. And put it out to the market to say, okay, this is the playbook and like, how are we yeah. going to put this in? How are we going to integrate it? You know, how's it going to be complementary innovation so it's not rip and replace, which is very difficult to do at a health system and a, and a five-year poll to be able to do that. Um, we have a, an amazing uh, audience here and participants um, from the payer side, some on the integrated delivery network side. You know, wrapping it up before question uh, Q and A, what can we do as a collective body and individuals to, to work with you in terms of taking this forward? Um, you know, very influencers within their organization, within their markets, within the industry. Um, what role can payers really play um, as to, to either help you do what you're doing now and the jobs to be done, the problems to be solved, and and help you transform in the future, even if we don't have an, a set set spot on the horizon to really kind of come together other than just the willingness and collaboration. Yeah, thanks for that. So I'd say two things. So NQF's strength comes from our collaboration. That is bar none. That's why we exist. So I think, you know, if you're interested in these topics in terms of measuring and improving healthcare, we'd love to have you at the table. Uh, you know, our, our committee rooms are always open to everybody. I, I meet um, industries all the time that uh, say that we are one of the few places where they can participate. And that, I've literally heard that from patient and consumer groups. I've heard it from Biopharma that says, you know, NQF opens the door to us. We, we absolutely believe that's the right model, right? We will arrive at the right answer, not because we concocted internally, but because of who we engage. So I would say, if you're interested in these topics, uh, please come engage us. If you're not interested in these topics, come talk to me for 30 seconds. Uh, and if you're still not interested in these topics, then I'll be shocked. Um, but uh, you've got to come engage us. Uh, you know, we are a membership organization. Part of our sustainability for all these years has been our members. It would be lovely to see, you know, more members. The other thing I will say, you know, when I think about what's on the horizon, um, disparities in healthcare is a tremendous topic. It is, I, I think now, it has been probably for some time uh, a critical issue, but I, I see there being a lot of critical mass around this issue now. Right, so health inequity, social determinants of health. This is uh, critically important. We've got to coalesce around this, much like we have done around other topics in recent years. We've put down a marker saying that we're going to try to be a leader on health uh, equity issues. Um, that's a place where I think we just all have to work together a lot, not just the payer community, the provider community, but high time we make sort of progress on that area. Yeah, that's great. And, and as a leader and, and where NQF needs to go, you know, I know that I'm... <laughs> Very grateful that you're over there as well. Um, I, 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 personally speaking, I know he's, Dr. Agawal isn't one to, to wait and see. I've never heard that come out of his mouth of saying, okay, well, let's just kind of wait and see and put that on the back burner. If it's the right thing to do, then let's do it with parallel efforts. Um, and if you're interested and, and want to talk to him, I'll be happy to give you his home number, his address. <laughs> um, he likes after midnight calls. That, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what, it's, that's what the commitment's all about. So. Um, I want to take the, the last few minutes here to, to open this up to question and answer, um, but we'll both be available afterwards and, and the days, weeks and to follow as well. So I don't know, if, Nick, if you have a mic. So with NQF, we keep calling national quality, right? But 
aren't there like international standards for some of these things? And you know, NHS has been there for over 50 years, or what, 68 years now. Um, so aren't they measuring something? Should it be, be accelerating some of this? It shouldn't take two years to endorse a measure on something that has existed in the industry for so long, right? So are there some standards that we look at, or is it just national and we have to build our own? You know, side, there, right? there is a concept of American exceptionalism. Uh, no, uh, you're, you're absolutely, you are 100% right. Um, so there are, you know, uh, when we try to establish frameworks, we actually do look abroad to whatever frameworks already exist. Now, uh, I think that helps at a strategic level. It helps at a prioritization level. A lot of the specific measurement issues, I will say, you know, our goal is to try to achieve consensus in this community. And so, you know, we can bring in as much information from a lot of different settings. But again, it, it is a... So, you know, I think it is a really national process that we are trying to undertake because we need folks in this ecosystem to agree that it's the right measure, it's the right approach. But we often do bring in data and evidence and concepts um, from anywhere you know, that they arise, anywhere that they're good. So we, we do certainly look outside the borders, um, but a lot of, I mean, you know, we, there is a bit of an American focus because I think rightly so, our system is actually pretty different. And it, it is in many ways fairly unique from the rest of the, of the world for better or for worse. And we do have this notion of let's achieve a consensus for the system that we have. I think they've been distracted by dessert. Oh, okay, right back there. Right here. Oh. Okay, um, this is Jeff Rifkin of IDC. So when you are looking at it, no keynote would be complete this week without talking about CVS Aetna. And when you look at the commoditization and regionalization of healthcare and how the providers have sort of pushed back saying, you know, this is endorsing not necessarily optimal quality. Has the National Quality Forum considered a standard around retail health care? And if so, and second question, would you consider as, as part of your brand to stand up against maybe the commoditization of health care as providers all, all being equal? Great questions. Um, we. We have, uh, so have we addressed retail specifically? Sort of, not really. I think we've coupled it with outpatient um, sort of practices generally. Uh, now, I think outpatient practices or outpatient care has lagged behind inpatient care in terms of development and having a lot of really great standards around it. So just one area, and this, this doesn't go exactly at the retail issue that you're describing, but you know, we've done a lot of work since our founding uh, focused on safety, particularly in the inpatient environment. I think we have left lagging safety in the outpatient environment, which I, I think does speak a little bit to the retail issue. So that's an area that we are explicitly gonna go to in 18. We've actually started some work uh, looking uh, you know, to lay the foundations for a significant outpatient safety approach um, that we will continue to develop in 18 and I think beyond that. Um, as far as taking a stand on um, various models, we don't. Right? You know, again, our, our uh, approach is we, we want to be the objective, unbiased intermediary in the center of healthcare. I don't want anybody to feel that they can't approach NQF or that we you know, stand for something else. I think what we really stand for, the only thing that we really stand for is quality. So if you can produce it in the retail environment, if you can, by all means, right? If you can produce it in another environment better than that, then that's where we will want to go. We stand for quality, we stand for patience. That's what it comes down to. Great, first off, I love the collar on this mic because it makes me feel like a 1970s sportscaster, so it's awesome. <laughs> the CBSI. And, and all of you, I feel like I'm throwing it to the field right now. But. So I'm a, I'm a pediatrician and then also run a medical group and a clinically integrated network, also a fledgling health plan, Medicaid health plan. So my life is schizophrenic. So my question will be schizophrenic as well. With regard to your prioritiz prioritization of quality measures, assuming you do um, uh, believe in the triple aim, quadruple aim if you care about physician satisfaction too, 
how does that, how do you prioritize that? So it, when it comes to, when you're, when you're looking at how you're gonna prioritize all those quality metri metrics, and you look at the triple aim, in some instances they're gonna be, not maybe not necessarily opposed to one another, but they can sometimes be in conflict. So can you address how you're gonna, what's the process for that, or how are you gonna prioritize that in the face of the triple or quadruple aim? Yeah, great question. Thanks for the uh, question from the booth. Uh, so, yeah, so we, this is the approach that we took on prioritization or that we are working to implement. Um, so we started asking, you know, from a top-down standpoint, let's put aside a second uh, the, the, the sort of endorsed portfolio set of measures that we have. Um, let's ask, you know, how do we arrive at the right measures if you're thinking, uh, if you're thinking on a national scale? And I think the triple aim is well kind of in, incorporated into that kind of thinking. So if you were, you know, the head of HHS, uh, what would you be concerned about uh, tracking in terms of the health of the nation, right? So we looked across the country, we looked internationally at what are some frameworks for really understanding top down, the highest, most important outcomes that, that any, you know, a system should be tracking. From those, when we kind of crystallized seven big outcomes, things like, you know, the functional status of citizens, their access to care, et cetera. S safety is obviously a really big deal still in our system, so that's really up there. So from that, we started asking, how do we disaggregate that into lower levels of measurement that apply to different care settings, that apply to different disease categories, some that are just rolled up irrespective of disease and care. You know, um, we should just be looking at all cause, say, safety, right, issues. Um, so that's the kind of approach that we took, and again, that, that was really supported by the National Academy of Medicine. We looked uh, at other frameworks. All right, so we had a framework. So then we have all these committees, and we then took the framework to six of our committees to pilot and said, take a look at your entire portfolio of measures and reflect. Do you actually agree with the framework? How would you tweak it? And then if you agree with the framework, apply your measures against it and see where it falls in there. And that's the process that we've been undertaking. And, and actually, in the six committees that we've done it with, we've already learned a fair amount, which is there are significant gaps, and the gaps tend to be higher in the framework. So, you know, aggregate measurement is really hard. Uh, both, you know, it's just technically challenging, but also there are very few stakeholders that want to develop those measures. So there's big gaps there. Uh, you know, lower down you go, more disease-specific, more sort of, uh, clinical site specific, you get more good measurement there. But that's the way that we've really thought about um, rolling out this prioritization so that we don't cause conflicts between the various elements of the triple aim. I think we can really arrive at a, a good intermediary position on all of those things. Throughout 18, we're then going to be rolling it out in, t in our entire portfolio. So, you know, it, in a, this time next year, we should have a very good sense of what our 630 measures are really pointing at, where they're not ideal, and where you know we think that we've got great footprint, work has really been done very well, and we can move on. I think we've kept you here long enough. So, oh, do you have one more question right here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I work for a health plan that will not be named. Um, can, can I? <laughs> Can I just ask, I'm going to reference the white elephant in the room, and if you could comment on the validity that, at least for payers, the critical milestone is NCQA adoption. Mm. And if there is validity to that, how do you promote the agenda to NCQA? So NCQA is, uh, you know, I, I take the question seriously. It's an important question. NCQA is a member of ours. They utilize our processes, our programs, very significantly. I think they have a very strong bias. It's not absolute. Nobody's got an absolute bias that says we will only use endorsed measures. Even the government does not have that. For better or for worse, that's the way it is, right? NCQA, you know, is a huge user of NQF. They often want, you know, they do want their measures endorsed. Um, I think we, we have a very good back and forth with them, uh, not just through the formal mechanisms, but my team and the NCQA team works very closely together. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, I can also see partnering with them in some ways that we might not have done historically. Um, you know, for example, they obviously, as you know, they create important certification standards for plans. I think there's a role that we can play to give them more evidence, um, sort of help inform some of their certification standards, and that's a conversation that we've uh, been having uh, just actually very recently. So, you know, 
I understand that there's an important dynamic there. I consider them a really, you know, they, the Joint Commission, CMS, there are some power users of NQF that we take very seriously that are kind of linchpins of the whole system working very well. Um, you know, so they're an important stakeholder of ours. Um, you know, would I like more of their measures to come in through endorsement? Absolutely. Would I like them to have a much tighter link to endorsement? I would, um, not because NQF needs to be important, it would be great if it is. More importantly, um, there is a uh, advantage to endorsement, which is you really do get the consensus of a wide variety of stakeholders that I think very few other entities in healthcare can really duplicate. That is critically important, right? I think it's, it's helpful to say, look, this measure is agreed upon by patients and providers that there, there is sort of nothing better than that. The other thing is we, we expose measurement to a lot of technical checks. Uh, and in fact, every single year, we are trying to roll out more uh, changes to our program that really evaluate the science behind measurement um, that I think is really critical, right? So whether it's clinical uh, adjustment for clinical risk factors, we recently got into adjustment for social risk factors, um, you know, all of those things are, I think, are, are critically important to, to progressing measurement science. And so, yes, I would absolutely love for more measures to come through that process, but, you know, programmatically it's not practical. I get that it's not. And, you know, sometimes you just need to do things programmatically that, uh, you know, is, is more timely. But my hope is that as we make our processes more efficient, make it more accessible, that it'll be possible for organizations like NCQA to be much more one-to-one -one correlated with NQF. You had mentioned consumer patients and providers kind of going through the, the endorsement. Is there any plans to build in a little bit more diversity in that kind of uh, that process? And that does that come from your membership? And if payers are, some payers are members of, of NQF, um, but if, if more do become, would that be something that we would introduce the diversity into that, that endorsement process? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think we've been asking really, I, I think, critically important strategic questions recently, which is, you know, um, there's a whole panoply of measurement in healthcare, as you all know, that have nothing to do with seeking endorsement, right? So providers are using measurements for quality improvement. They need a lot more measurement, or they need a lot more science and rigor behind QI measures. I, I recently went to a company that um, wanted to talk because they had a great measurement program, and they said, we have 2,000 measures ready to go and roll out. And I was like, oh my God, you are gonna be hated in healthcare. <laughs> like 2,000 measures that you're just gonna release into the wild, that is insane. So, you know, I, I, and you know, there's lots of companies selling QI measurement that I think is good and bad and there's such a wide degree of variability. Then you've got, um, you know, uh, registry-based measurement that is uh, sort of brand new and emerging is gonna be, I think, a new power center in measurement. And very few of those two things, and then there's other areas in measurement, really seek endorsement, right? So what do we do? How do we respond to this wider world of measurement? And I think strategically the question for us is, you know, if, if, the, if the goal of NQF is let's make measurement good, let's align around what the right outcomes in, in quality are, then we have to be open to different approaches. I don't want hospitals using quality improvement, certain quality improvement measures that are not the right measures, right, that are not correlated to the right outcomes, that are just being sold by companies that want to make a profit but that haven't put the right science into it. So I think for us to be able to effectuate that kind of change, we've got to say, come to us. We've got a lot of expertise. We've got access to a lot of expertise. We'll help make measures better, and it doesn't matter if you want endorsement. That last bit is a real cultural challenge for NQF. Um, I, you know, it's a lot of internal dialogue. We are not there yet. Um, but I think we've got to get to a place that says, we want to interact with you to make this whole field better, whether or not your goal is that gold star at the end. And maybe there's other labels that we can give to you to make it kind of worth your while. But that's the kind of, uh, I think, approach and thinking that we are working on, we're exploring, and maybe we'll see some progress in that. And, yeah, and they, creating they dialogue here. with stakeholders we normally wouldn't have a dialogue That's with. Right. It's building understanding, through that comes the trust, and then we're gonna start valuing our differences. And I don't think we're gonna be able to get that multi-stakeholder, multi-institution collaboration that is absolutely crucial for transformation unless we can actually value our differences. Too, too busy to, to dismiss that we're not the same and, and not working together. So if we can start building that together, that would be great, and I appreciate it. And round of applause for Dr. Agarwal, please.
Please join me in thanking Chantado and Rahul.